I'm going to, of course, continue today, of course, talking about ancient or ancient Egypt, our first lecture on that, which uh, mostly today I'm going to get into like some of the early background of Egypt. I'll talk about like geography of Egypt, uh, its early history. I'll talk about the culture of Egypt. I do go in today and I'll talk about the uh, like the gods of Egypt that were famous uh, and also the um, also mummification, like how they mummified people uh, and all that. And then probably next week we'll get into the bulk of, of Egypt because uh, it's probably going to take like two or three days, you know, to cover Egypt. And uh, it's likely that after um, next week, we'll probably have an exam probably in week five. So um, I know you're probably working on your study guides right now uh, and all that, but that will not be due uh, until week five. Uh, also, uh, I'm thinking uh, maybe one of my announcements, I may have mentioned about the uh, first key terms assignment. That is coming due soon. Uh, however, I have pushed the due date back because uh, we were out a week. So the due date for that, it's the it says the 21st of September, we go to the assignment. But if you want to start turning that in next week, you can go ahead and start sending it to me Monday coming up. Uh, just You can go ahead and just post it to the speed grader on Canvas, and I can grade them quickly. Uh, if you can't figure that out, you can, I guess, email it. Um, and the study guides can also be uploaded to the speed grader as well. All right, so anyway, uh, of course, I'm going to get into, and I'm going to, of course, talk about uh, ancient Egypt today. Uh, and um, there, of course, is the PowerPoint sl slide, of course, on ancient Egypt. And uh, Egypt, of course, uh, is, as you know, uh, considered one of the four river valley civilizations that we've been talking about. I think we already talked about the other three uh, briefly before, and we've mostly just done Mesopotamia so far. Uh, we need to do, of course, India and China later. And um, for a long time, uh, Egypt was considered one of the oldest civilizations uh, in the world. Uh, but since the 1800s, 19th century, uh, they figured out that it's the fourth oldest compared to the other ones. And of course, Egypt, you know, is based in uh, North Africa uh, along the Nile River Basin. Uh, and uh, there's a famous quote uh, that Herodotus said um, about Egypt. And um, he said that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. It was a gift. Uh, and uh, what he meant by that was the fact that uh, because of the fertile Nile River Valley, uh, it allowed the Egyptians to farm, you know, have agriculture. And that led to eventually them developing the civilization. And so that's what Herodotus meant by, you know, that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. Uh, Herodotus, of course, was one of the first to write about Egypt. Uh, there's some even speculate that he may have even traveled to Egypt. Uh, possibly, and even toured the pyramids and stuff like that. And he's one of the first to write about that uh, also as well. So let me go ahead and first talk about Egypt a little bit with the Nile River. The Nile, uh, of course, uh, as you know, is one of the most famous rivers in the world. Of course, it's kind of an unusual river, uh, if you know about this, because it flows northward, right? It's kind of strange about that. Uh, most rivers seem to flow north to south or east to west or whatever. Uh, but the reason why it's flowing um, south south to north is because of the way Africa is like slanted in the north. Equator is like right here in the middle. So everything's sloping down toward the Mediterranean Sea. There's all these escarpments that are kind of going down as the river goes towards um, what is the Mediterranean Sea, where Cairo is and all that. And... Um, one thing that, that's famous about the Nile River, it's the longest river in the world. Uh, I think the average mileage of the river with its tributaries is probably around 4,200 miles. I think it's actually 4,189 to be exact, but close to 4,200 miles is how long the river is, which is second to like, I think the Amazon. Um, now you can see here, the Nile has different tributaries. You've got the Blue Nile and you got the White Nile. So the White Nile is a, a river that actually starts way down in East Central Africa. It's actually the main source of the White Nile is Lake Victoria, which flows north through 
through uh, Sudan. The Blue Nile uh, starts way over here, like in um, Ethiopia, which is about right there on that little map. Uh, and um, it flows to the west and then joins with the um, other white, the White Nile to form like one trunk where the city of Khartoum is in Sudan. So these two rivers eventually form like one trunk together and form the main part of the river. And from there, they flow northward, you know, into Egypt. Uh, yeah, you'll notice on the bottom here, it says it's fed by monsoons. Yeah, it's true. Like most of the rivers, like the blue and the white, are fed by a lot of monsoons. You know, I don't know if you know what a monsoon is, but monsoons are these rainy seasons that they get in Africa and they get them in Asia. And it's one of the main sources of, of both those rivers, especially the Blue Nile. Blue Nile is actually the main source of the actual Nile. It gets, I think, like 70, 80 percent of the water that goes down the Nile goes down the Blue Nile. It starts like in the mountains of Ethiopia and all that. Um, and, um, oh, the colors, you're going about the name, like white versus blue. The White Nile is called that because it's got kind of a whitish color to it. The Blue Nile's got, got a name because of its more of a bluish color to the water. So hence the names and all that. You'll notice also as the river goes north, northward from Khartoum, it goes down these um, so-called cataracts, they're called, which are numbered one through six here. Cataracts are a series of waterfalls or rapids uh, that are along the whole course of the river, of the Nile. And um, the reason why they're numbered one through six uh, is because when the British were exploring the Nile River in the 1800s, uh, the explorers went from Egypt into Sudan. So they had to climb up each, you know, waterfall to get to Khartoum here. Uh, so I imagine they were counting them. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, six of them that are there. So most of them are in Sudan, like upper Sudan, uh, two through six. And then there was one actually, I don't know if it's there anymore much, but it's where the Aswan High Dam is and all that right there. So that's the importance of the Nile River. And, uh, of course, you can see it keeps flowing northward. Uh, through kind of like a valley here where uh, the city of Luxor is today. And this is more of a flatter plain down here where the, what happens is the river then empties out uh, into like a delta area, um, which the term delta at the end of a river basin uh, was a term the Greeks coined from um, the letter Greek letter delta, which is the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet, just like a D. Uh, and uh, so it forms like this uh, triangle-shaped uh, delta area, which flows out in the Mediterranean. It's close to where Cairo over here and Alexandria is over here, those cities. Uh, the name Nile has been around a long time. Uh, they think it's the name of Nile itself is derived mostly from Greek, uh, Nilos or Nilus, which is the Latin name. And Nilo, Nilos is supposedly a name that means um, river, basically, or some people say great river uh, as well. And it's believed that the ancient Egyptians um, called the Nile the river, or great river, or maybe even great canal. May have been also another translation, but it usually means just river. Uh, in this little part of the slide here, uh, you'll notice it says Nile's floodplain versus the desert regions. Well, the area that's real fertile. Uh, is an area uh, that was often called uh, Kemet, which is, uh, I'll give you the translation, usually means uh, black land, yeah, Kemet or black land. And that was the fertile areas of Egypt where most of people lived. It was what the Egyptians called Egypt. Egypt was called Kemet, uh, basically. Why it was because the fertile soil and I guess the silt that would wash up you had to use to fertilize and grow their crops uh, and all that. And they had another term they had, which was uh, deshret, which means um, red land. Um, and that was um, the, the red land deshret was where the deserts were, like where unfertile areas uh, throughout Egypt uh, and all that. Those are like on both sides of the river 
outside the green green area. You saw in that video, everything was kind of green along the river basin uh, and all that. And in Egypt, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, like uh, if you go to a picture, I'll show you real quick uh, on Egypt. But you can see like in this picture here how dramatic it is uh, between like green, uh, yeah, green areas here, grass and other stuff, shrubs and trees growing there along the bank. And then once you get out into the desert, you know, so it's all sand uh, that's there. So pretty drastic difference between the fertile area around the riverbank and the actual desert areas. Pretty much most of Egypt is desert, like 90% desert uh, overall, except for various oases that are here and there. So um, now Egypt uh, also had different uh, seasons that they had. Uh, the most famous one was the uh, Akhet, which was what they call the flood season or uh, the really the proper name to use uh, is um, inundation, inundation. That's the word because uh, the river would gradually flood over several weeks uh, during the summer months, like from around June, July, August, September was usually the time period of when the Nile would flood, which would bring its silt, which they'd use to fertilize uh, their crops. And uh, the kind of crops that they mostly grew in Egypt were mostly like grain crops, like um, barley, wheat type crops, sorghum uh, primarily. They also had the date palm uh, and, and things like that they grew. So mostly that agricultural type, you know, civilization. Uh, but the main diet of most Egyptians was like beer and bread, like especially for the poor populations. And um, uh, then they have what they call a uh, paret. A uh, paret was the what they call the um, sowing season. A uh, sowing season that used to happen before the flood season. That's where they would plant their crops uh, throughout Egypt. And then, of course, the flood the flood season would come, uh, and um, and they would kind of just wait, I guess, until uh, things start growing. And then, of course, another one is called um, uh, usually uh, Shamu, um, Shema, I think I said, uh, which is the harvest season, which came after the flood season. That's when they would harvest their crops uh, throughout Egypt. Although Egypt had probably like we do today, you know, two growing seasons, uh, one in the probably fall and one in the spring and all that. Uh, but they didn't have summer. I guess they had summer all the time. No, no winter, no winter, but always summer all the time. <laughs> I guess pretty hot over there because uh, it's close to the equator. So, but yeah, the flood season was the most important, you know, vital period, you know, uh, of the growing seasons, you know, that that Egypt had. And I guess if there was a drought. Or something like that. Uh, they either blame the gods or they blame the Pharaoh in power. <laughs> One of the two, uh, or both, I guess. Uh, so, anyway, um, so just kind of some of the background about geography, about Egypt, uh, and all that. Uh, let me get into next uh, and talk about uh, how Egypt gets unified, uh, which does happen. There's kind of a debate about when it was, but they think Egypt became a unified state sometime around the 32nd century B.C. And the king that did that was a king named King Menes, uh, who went by also the name Narmer. They think he's the same person as far as they can figure out from uh, Egyptian history and all that. And um, uh, if you know about Menes, one, one of the things that he did, which is important, important Menes uh, basically unified uh, Egypt's uh, two kingdoms that they had. But I'll put them up here. They had one kingdom that was called the Lower Kingdom and the other kingdom that was called the Upper Kingdom. So they had these two states that they had. And it's kind of debated about how far back they go, maybe 33, 3400 BC, somewhere around that time. They may have existed uh, at one point. And um, you saw in the video how they divided up Egypt. Uh, if you saw that in the video, um, I'm sure you did. Um, let me show you real quick here. But um, there's a slide up here, I think, that showed. Well, this one I guess I can use right here. 
but they said, remember correctly, the uh, this part of Egypt, like around the delta part at the end of the river, was called Lower Egypt. So that's where the Lower Kingdom was, believed to be like around the delta where Cairo is now. And in the Upper Kingdom was in this area, Luxor is up in that area, which is what they call Upper Egypt. And that sounds confusing, but uh, it has to do with the river course, of where the river is, not with the geography of the state of Egypt now. Uh, and so basically, Lower Egypt is the northern part of Egypt, close to the Mediterranean Sea. And then the upper part of Egypt is in the southern part of Egypt, more into the valley of the river, which is more mountainous up in here, where Luxor is. Okay, so that's the difference uh, between the two uh, areas that are basically there. Uh, also, one thing, they don't know too much about the kings um, of, of those two states. I think they know more about the upper kingdom uh, than the lower kingdom. Uh, like I'll get to later, King Menes or Narmer. I know so you know about him. I think there's a few others you may have heard of. You probably never heard of Ka, K-A, but there was one named uh, Scorpion King. You may have heard of him because they made some movies about him several years ago. I think The Rock was in. It's kind of comical, but uh, I think there were two of them. But uh, anyway, um, um, anyway, uh, this particular king may have existed, the Scorpion King. And I think they think he was the king before Narma or Menaz came in. So that's like the only three they know about, Ka, Scorpion King, and then Narmer. Um, oh, oh, one more thing about the kings. The... Uh, Lower the lower uh, kingdom, the, the king wore a um, red crown, and then the other state, which is the upper kingdom, the uh, king wore a white crown. That's kind of important uh, to know uh, about ancient Egypt uh, because um, later on, what's going to happen when Menes comes along and other pharaohs, they're going to combine these two states like into one kingdom or an empire. And the, the pharaoh is going to wear both crowns. He wears the red and the white crown of both states. And so that's how Egypt, you know, eventually unified. So we're talking about Narmer here. And um, so Narmer is the one they think that uh, founded one of the first royal dynasties in Egypt. And they think he was a king, like I said, of the upper kingdom. And he conquered the lower kingdom and merged the two together uh, as one state. Uh, and uh, and so um, what's the deal with the different names? Well, uh, Narmer is his Egyptian name. That's the name that they found in hieroglyphs uh, in Egypt. Uh, however, the Greeks had their own names for these pharaohs later. And uh, Menes was called um, that name by a uh, Egyptian writer named Manetho. Uh, he was writing around the time of the Ptolemaic dynasty. And uh, Herodotus has his own version of the name, which is just Men, but it's spelled M-I-N usually. So Men. So it's either Men or Menes was the Greek name. But Menes is the more popular name. Uh, they call him now. Uh, Menes, besides unifying Egypt, was known for being the founder of the Egyptian city of Memphis, which was founded close to Cairo near the Delta area of the Nile. And uh, Memphis uh, became a very important city for the Egyptians. It was like their administrative capital, where the pharaohs ruled from. Uh, the term pharaoh evolved over time for what they call the pharaoh's palace. It's called like Great House or something like that. So they called him a pharaoh later. And um, anyway, uh, Menes is the one that kind of started the whole you know, unified kingdom. And you can see even developed some commercial trading um, throughout that region around Africa. Also, if you get up this slide too, does mention, yeah, he does adopt the new crown of Egypt, which I told you, red and white, you know, the two colors of Egypt. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, the crowns themselves were kind of famous uh, for having these symbols on them, like on the lower kingdom's crown, they had a cobra, like on the red one, a cobra, and then the other one, which is the lower kingdom's uh, crown, which was white, uh, was a vulture. And it's become like, you'll see it later on some of the crowns of the pharaohs. They have wear both of them. I guess they're kind of like mascots, you know, of each, you know, of those states. So 
And that was just the names that they called it. Like Sayent was, I think, the Greek name that they called the double crown, which was red and white. And then um, Sekemti, I think how they say it, was the Egyptian name for it. So that's who Narmer was. Uh, they have found this thing uh, in Egypt around 1898 that's called the Narmer palette. I don't know if you have to know about much about that as much, but the Narmer palette was this cosmetic palette that was made of siltstone that was found by archaeologists in, around 1898 in Egypt. And uh, it supposedly depicts King Narmer's reign uh, as a ruler. And it shows how he unified the state of Egypt. Uh, and um, I think on one side it shows him with the um, one crown, and he's got the other crown over here, I think is what it is. And um, it says cosmetic palette. Uh, they think this palette was some kind of thing that was used to, like, paint statues. Um, or maybe mummies, I don't know. But uh, they would put, like, cosmetic paint or whatever on it, and they would paint stuff with it. And so it somehow survived from over 5,000 years ago. And supposedly has some of the oldest hieroglyphic-type writing uh, in Egypt on it. Uh, let me also talk about the fact that Egypt is also divided historically into three main periods. Uh, so you got the either called the three main historical periods of Egypt, or usually called the three kingdoms of ancient Egypt. Uh, you can see them right there in chronological order. You got the old kingdom first, and started around the 26th century BC. Uh, then you got the middle kingdom, started around the 21st century BC. Then the new kingdom started around the 16th century BCE. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of give you a little history about each one. Uh, obviously, under the old kingdom, uh, they began to have like an organized central state with these absolute rulers that were pharaohs, as they were called. And uh, a lot of it was associated with their religion and gods. And, of course, the pharaoh was powerful. as this kind of like godlike ruler. But um, there was also a theocracy where the priests controlled everything. Um, then, of course, you have the pyramids of Egypt were built. Most of them were built, including uh, Khufu, who was the most famous king of that time, who built the Great Pyramid. Um, however, the, the, the state eventually collapsed around the 22nd century, you can see. They do have these intermediate periods that, that come in Egypt. Like there's one between the old and middle, which is the first intermediate period. There's one called the second intermediate period, just between the middle and new. There is actually one called the Third Intermediate Period that comes after the New Kingdom ended as well. The video kind of went into that a little bit about that. Metal Kingdom is not as well known. Uh, it's more of a weaker period of Egypt, but you can see they began to develop more better farming uh, in Egypt. And you can see they even started making contacts with, with different parts of the Middle East, Crete, probably even, yeah, they probably trade with the Minoans sometime around that time and even during the New Kingdom as well. Uh, Hyksos, of course, I'll get to them later, but they invaded at the end of the Middle Kingdom in the 17th century, and that led to the Second Intermediate Period, which was between the Middle and New Kingdoms. So these intermediate periods are kind of chaotic periods where the state's not unified. Uh, New Kingdom, of course, was the most famous of the three kingdom periods, and the New Kingdom was a period where the pharaohs were really powerful and their empire stretched into the Near East, into what is Syria, and also part of Mesopotamia, like in the upper Euphrates Valley. Uh, and um, the New Kingdom is known for the building of the Valley of the Kings, which I'll get to later. And it's also known for all these different pharaohs that reigned, which I've got there, but I'll talk about some other ones later, like Queen Hatshepsut, you probably heard of her, uh, King Tut, Ramses the Great, uh, and so those are, you know, different rulers that were at that time in the New Kingdom. And um, eventually at the end of the Bronze Age, uh, the New Kingdom declined and eventually collapsed, uh, especially at that period when the uh, Sea Peoples came in. And so the period after this, after 1070 anyway, is often called the post-Empire period in Egypt. And during the post-Empire period, Egypt is conquered by a lot of foreign powers, 
Uh, the Assyrians come in. Uh, I think the Chaldeans may have conquered it briefly. Persians, Greeks, Romans. Uh, so for the next something like 2,000 years or more, uh, Egypt is actually occupied by foreign powers. So we'll get more into the different kingdoms of Egypt. Predominantly, I'm just going to talk about the old kingdom and the new kingdom, which a lot of these I'll talk about probably next week. All right, let me next get to and talk about also the gods of Egypt. So you got these different gods they have, which I'll talk about most of those that they have. The Egyptians had a lot of gods. Like I want to say close to about 100 gods. You know, a lot of these gods were part of like Egyptian mythology, uh, which went back two, 3,000 years ago. Uh, and um, really more than that, but um, a lot of them were based off of like culture and part of their um, like different religious mythology and, and also uh, their way of life. Uh, the Egyptians, you know, believed that the um, your soul was eternal and that uh, your, your soul was kind of like Ra, like never dying. Uh, and one of the chief gods that was very famous with the Egyptians was the god Amun. Do you see right here? Amun was the king of the Egyptian gods. Uh, he became really powerful uh, by the new kingdom. And uh, the name Amun, uh, which is spelled different ways, is a name in um, hieroglyphics that means the hidden one. The fact that uh, he was uh, invisible but all-powerful. Uh, and um, Amun was usually in the image of a man, uh, which you see here on the right. And it became part of a, a state religion. It was like a state cult that was superior to all the other religious cults they had. Uh, and um, its main headquarters, of course, uh, where it was practiced the most, was at the Temple of Karnak, which is where the city of Luxor is in southern Egypt. And like I said, there were hundreds of priests that ran it. Uh, and uh, it was like a theocracy. That's how much power the priests of Amun had overall. Uh, the god Amun, or Amun was eventually uh, merged with the god Ra. Ra, of course, was the sun god of Egypt. Oh, and by the way, Amun was like, um, he was kind of like a creator god in solar deity, and so was Ra. Ra was mostly a solar deity, but I guess seen as creating all life. Uh, and uh, what happened was over time, the two were eventually merged together as like kind of seen as the same God, Amun and Ra. And so a lot of times they'll kind of refer to as the cult of Amun Ra. That's the name, the main, I guess, the what they call the state cult or religion of, of Egypt. Uh, it's he's spelled in different ways. Uh, you'll see it spelled that way, A-M-E-N or A-M-O-N. And it's pronounced all kinds of ways. I don't think they know exactly how it was pronounced, but uh, Amun's popular. Some people say Amun, and then some people say Amun, uh, believe it or not, but not Amun. That's, you know, something else. Um, now, a lot of the Greeks, like Alexander the Great and others that came into Egypt and then the Romans uh, thought that Amun was like the god Zeus or Jupiter. So a lot of times I think the Greeks would sometimes call the god Zeus Amun. Uh, so, so it was a pretty important god, you know, in the um, Egyptian mythology. All right, then you had uh, other gods which were important too, uh, which of course the next one I'll give you is the god Anubis. Uh, Anubis was one of the gods, Egyptian gods of the dead, uh, often called the jackal god because he's got this jackal head to him. You can see here. Anubis was the god associated with like embalming, what we call mummification, where they would, um, you know, bury people using embalming uh, practices, which now are called mummification. And um, Anubis was important because he was kind of seen as the uh, judge of the dead in the afterworld, like in the Egyptian afterlife. And it's, they actually, Egyptians actually believed that your heart in your body would be weighed against the feather uh, to see how good or bad you were. Which I think they call it the weighing of the heart. And so he judged the dead uh, and all of that. 
And a lot of priests or people that would mummify you would wear like a jackal mask. So you can see here, Anubis is an example of one of several Egyptian gods that were anthropomorphic, like part animal, part man. Uh, here's a slide I, I didn't, I think in the last class I didn't have it in there, but Horus, of course, of course, another god that's famous uh, in Egyptian mythology. Uh, Horus is the so-called falcon god. Uh, he was considered associated with the, uh, what is the sky, like a sky god. He was also uh, the god of kingship. Uh, usually the pharaoh, when he was on the throne, was kind of seen as the embodiment of that god. Because uh, I told you, you know, the pharaohs are kind of like living gods and all of that. And Horus, uh, in some mythologies, is the son of uh, two other gods, which are Osiris and Isis, who are married to each other, like a husband and wife. There's Horus when he's got his uh, that double-headed crown on there I told you about that's white and red. Uh, Isis, of course, uh, of course um, is considered one of the greatest goddesses of ancient Egypt. She's sometimes associated with the same goddess, which is Hathor, which is similar. And um, that's her on the right. Uh, looks like giving um, eternal life to what is Queen Nefertari, uh, who was one of the wives of Ramses the Great. Isis was mostly known as the goddess of fertility, sex, marriage, and alcohol. That's good. Uh, and of course, love. You can throw that in there, but mostly a fertility goddess uh, as a whole. She, of course, is seen as the king's um, mother. Because Horus is her son. And of course, she is the wife of Osiris. Uh, and uh, usually she's the image of a woman with cow horns on her head which cow horns are kind of like a symbol of um, fertility. Uh, Osiris, of course, was her husband. Uh, and uh, Osiris was uh, the so-called Egyptian king of the dead. He ruled over the Egyptian underworld or afterlife. Kind of a fertility god too as well, you can see. But um, Osiris is kind of important because um, he's the reason why a lot of Egyptians wanted to be mummified uh, because in some myths, uh, if you know about the story about this, Osiris was, um, he was killed by his brother Set, and his brother tried to take over Egypt, and uh, Horus banished him and seized control of the kingdom. That's why the, 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 the pharaohs are associated with Horus and not Set. Um, Isis supposedly mummified him, uh, put his, you know, all his body parts together and mummified him. And uh, she became the king of the dead. Uh, Set was supposedly the brother of Osiris. Uh, it was kind of seen as kind of being almost maybe kind of an evil god or bad god. Uh, and it's mostly a god associated with several attributes, uh, chaos, god of chaos, uh, god of deserts, um, god of infertility. And he's also a, like a storm god. He's associated with storms, like desert storms and things like that. And um, I'm not sure what he is. He might be some kind of cat god uh, in that image, I think. But Set was, or Seth, um, was believed to have been maybe possibly a king of Egypt at one point and tried to overthrow his brother Osiris. But I told you, Horus banished him uh, to the deserts of Egypt. Uh, there's also Toph, of course, famous god. Yeah, the bird god, you may have seen it before. He's like a white crane bird. And uh, Toph, of course, was the Egyptian god of like wisdom, knowledge, um, anything to do with knowledge, where it be math, science, medicine, whatever. Um, Toph is also believed to be the Egyptian god that gave the Egyptians the hieroglyphic writing that they write in later. So the god of the scribes or writers on uh, Egypt. Of course, in the video, they talk about papyrus, right? That, that that type of Egyptian plant or hedge plant that grows in the Nile River Basin. Uh, Toph is supposedly the one that gave him uh, papyrus. And papyrus, of course, was like an early form of paper. Uh, if you know about a long time ago, um, or that, you know, wood paper, you didn't have much choice on writing. Either, you know, like, like, like Sumerians, you had to write on clay tablets, is what they were doing originally. But the Egyptians have been at papyrus, where you can use with ink, write on it. 
Uh, and then, uh, as you know, the like I think it was Israelites and others started using parchment paper, animal skin, like the write the early Bibles and scrolls. Uh, and then, of course, the Chinese invented wood paper, you know, later. So anyway, but that's just a little about Toth, uh, who he was, that bird god. And then uh, also one more added to was Sobek. Sobek, uh, of course, the famous crocodile god uh, of Egypt, you know. And have got to have crocodiles, and uh, and uh, anyway, uh, he's yeah the guy of the crocodiles, but he's also associated with the pharaohs, like the the power of the pharaoh. Uh, he's associated with like male fertility, and like a kind of like a war god, uh, associated with military power uh, as well. Uh, he did have a cult center at one point, uh, which was in Fayum, which is in kind of the western desert, west of the Nile. In the, where there's an oasis there in Western Egypt. Uh, and um, most of these gods had cult centers, you know, where, where the gods were practiced the most uh, as a whole. But that's just some of the most famous gods. I didn't go through all of them, but there's, I think they had at least 100 of them that they had at one point. All right, yeah, one of the things I want to talk about lastly today uh, of course, I'm going to, of course, get into, and I will talk about mummification for a few minutes. Uh, and, of course, which is something real famous, you know, that the Egyptians, of course, are known for. And, of course, that is, you know, preparing uh, the dead uh, for the afterlife. Um, it's, of course, all kinds of names. They, the, the proper name, obviously, is the Egyptian funerary practices. But uh, because of, like, the Arabs a long time ago, uh, the term that they started using eventually was the term mummification. Uh, and um, the origin of the word mummification or the word mummy uh, came from uh, what is this Arabic word here or term, which is mamiya, which is spelled different ways, M-U-M-M-I-A or M-U-M-M-I-Y-A. It's an Arabic term, and it's like the Arabic term for what they call tar pitch or asphalt. Uh, and I think the scientific name is sometimes called bitumen. It's kind of a black substance, as you see here, just made of different materials like, I think it's got sulfur in it and petroleum type you know, ingredients in it. And uh, they believe that this uh, material was used in the mummification process, like to cover the body and preserve it. So that's why sometimes mummies will have kind of a dark looking color to them, either brownish or blackish looking color. Uh, and um, over time, the term mummy stuck. And so people started calling it mummification, a mummy. When they see a corpse, they say mummy, you know, to it. And so that's where the name came about. Uh, the weird thing about it was they also had like the substance was used for other things like medicine. It sounds kind of crazy, but they took the outside of the mummy, uh, the mummia, they would ground it into like a powder, which they called it mummia or mummy powder, I believe as well. And people would take it as a medicine. They put it like in their tea or whatever. They thought it would make them live longer. <laughs> you know, um, I guess vitality or whatever they called it. And, uh, you know, a long time ago, they used to take all kinds of stuff that they thought was like a good drug for themselves. Like, I think some people took like arsenic, if you know about this, uh, they would consume. A lot of this stuff was poison they found later. Uh, and then, of course, also uh, they would make pain out of it um, as well. So uh, anyway, um, the process took a long time. It took about 70 days, more than two months, to actually embalm somebody and, of course, make a mummy. And so they're actually specialized embalmers. They would have they had shops that would do this. Obviously, it wasn't free. It cost money. Uh, and so most people that could afford it were predominantly like upper middle classes. Uh, a lot of the lower classes, a lot of times that they did get mummified, it wasn't that good of a process or they were just, their body was mummified or just mummified by the desert. They put it underground and that helped to preserve the body uh, as well. Uh, a lot of the people that, that of course did it would wear these jackal masks, of course, which represented the, the god of Anubis, which represented you know god of the dead that dealt with you know mummification in the afterlife. 
Uh, now, uh, what happened, one of the first things that they would do when they would mummify people was that they would remove all the organs. They would take those out of your body, uh, like your lungs, your stomach, intestines, liver, so on. And then uh, also they took out your brain. I don't know if you know this or not, but they would uh, actually take some kind of like, they take this kind of hook thing here and they would break your like uh, sinus cavity bone back up in here where your nose is right here. And they would rip your brains out. They would liquefy it and they would pour it out your brain. Uh, and um, I think they didn't keep that part uh, for some reason. And then they would take the uh, organs they would put them in what they call canopic jars, which are these clay vessels. And um, there were uh, different uh, Egyptian gods that would protect them. Uh, you can see here, those are the four, Dalmatef, Kabesanef, Happy, and Mseti. Happy is spelled different ways, usually without the two Ps. I think it's usually like um, spelled like that. And... Um, it's pronounced, I think, happy or hoppy. One of the two, probably happy. And um, so each one would protect certain organs. So Domatef, which looks like a jackal, would protect the stomach. Kabesadef, uh, which looked like a falcon, would protect the intestines. The happy, which looked like a baboon, would protect the lungs. And Imseti, which looks like a human, would protect the liver. Uh, hoppy was also the, um, supposedly one of the Egyptian gods that was associated with the Nile flood like when the river flooded and all that. So they would put the organs in there, probably salt them down, uh, and then they would um, put them back in with your coffin. Now, one of the big things that would happen, uh, what they would do after that uh, was that they would then uh, fill the body cavities up uh, with different materials, uh, like I think linen. Uh, I think there's even other ideas that they put like um, maybe the um, pit tar pitch in there, the mamia. I think uh, what is um, I think there was another theory that they put some kind of tree resin inside the body, which was called myrrh, M Y R R H, which is what Herodotus called it. And uh, but they had this other thing called natron, which was mineral salt. Um, they would cover uh, the entire corpse in it. Uh, which was really the most important stage, really, in mummification, was the use of the mineral salt. That helped to um, preserve the body and get rid of all the moisture. And they would do that for 40 days, that they would dry out the body with salt. Uh, and then after the body, um, after they finished with that with the body, uh, the, then the body would be prepared to be wrapped after that. And, of course... That was the final stage, you know, that they did um, after that, uh, which was uh, they then wrapped the body, uh, which it's, it's believed that they would put that tar pitch or mamia on the body, cover, cover the body with it, and then they would start bandaging the person right there, the corpse, and then they would put keep put more on it, probably layers of it, and cover the whole body in it. Uh, then they would put like a death mask on your, or or they put some kind of painting of your face uh, on the head, uh, and then you might be put into a coffin uh, if you could afford one. So, so that was the whole process of of mummification. Yeah, they found thousands and thousands of mummies in Egypt. Uh, yeah, they can go visit. One of the river centers got one down downtown that's been there for years. Uh, the, the mummy. Um, actually, I've actually seen King Tut's mummy uh, years ago, uh, including his death mask. So it's pretty, pretty neat uh, in how they did this process and all this. But very few people got a gold death mask, you know, except probably the kings uh, and all that. So anyway, um, that's pretty much my lecture today um, on ancient Egypt. Uh, now, um, if there's any questions uh, of course, about the lecture today. That's pretty much all I'm doing today uh, with Egypt. Uh, of course, next next week, I'll be getting more into uh, talking about uh, the main part of Egypt. I'll talk, of course, mostly about the main kingdoms of Egypt, which are the old, the new kingdoms. Of course, on uh, Monday's class, I'll talk about 
the pyramids of Egypt, like the great pyramid that was built. And I guess I'll talk about how they were built. Um, I'll talk about the development of um, hieroglyphic writing. I'll get into the new kingdom and the development of the Valley of the Kings. We'll get into the, all the pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, if we have, should have time, maybe do that a little bit. Uh, and um, so uh, anyway, uh, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Uh, like send me a comment right now or question if you have any. Uh, also, uh, don't forget that you can, uh, of course, uh, send me comments and questions uh, at this lecture or the previous one that was this morning. You can ask questions about that one as well, which you do get bonus points for. So don't forget about that. Now, a few reminders before I go today. Um, now, you saw at the beginning of class, I did post uh, the um, two Canvas quizzes, the two new ones up, uh, which, of course, you've got the Canvas quiz, of course, on Mesopotamia, the second quiz. Uh, and um, that one is due next uh, Wednesday, September the 16th. And then, of course, don't forget about the other Canvas quiz, which is the video quiz, uh, which is, of course, on the uh, little documentary I gave you to watch, which is called The uh, Seven Wonders of Ancient Egypt. So both those are due the same time next Wednesday, uh, September 16th. Also, I had reminders, too, uh, tonight. Uh, don't forget, if you have not finished the Canvas quiz on prehistory, uh, please get that done. I've sent out numerous, you know, reminders about it, uh, but get that done. It expires at midnight. Uh, and also next week, you can start turning in your vocab to me. Um, I'll probably put up the new one soon too next week. But the first key terms will probably be due, like I said, uh, I think I told you the 21st of September, but you can go ahead and start turning it in to me on Canvas and the speed grader. So anybody have any questions before we go? I don't know if anybody has anything they want to ask me uh, about anything. So I don't know if anybody has a question or not. So nobody does. Uh, but, yeah, you can just, um, you know, let me know later uh, about it. Uh, and I um, uh, hope you all have a good weekend. Uh, this is kind of a short week because we didn't have class Monday because of uh, the Larry holiday. But you all have a good weekend coming up, and I'll see you all, of course, uh, next week. So y'all take care and so I guess keep safe.